interesting. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. We're going to read the entire chapter. Hopefully the audio will be fixed. Hopefully they'll let me know that the audio is fixed by the time we get to the end of um, Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. Another little thing I should let you know. The capital L-O-R-D, which is Yahweh, which you'll hear me read Yahweh. I should have highlighted all of them in yellow. I missed a bunch, like 15, I think. Uh, I highlighted some, and I didn't highlight others. I apologize. That's one of those days. Um, but Jonah, chapter 1. Let's begin. The word of Yahweh came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. A great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laid down, and fallen sound asleep. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Each man said to his mate, Come, let us cast lots so that we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, Tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and from what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. And I fear Yahweh, God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, How could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of Yahweh, because he had told them. So they said to him, What should you do, or what should we do, um, that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. And he said to them, Pick me up, throw me to the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rode desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. And they called on Yahweh and said, We earnestly pray, O Yahweh, do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us, for you, O Yahweh, have done as you pleased. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. And the men feared Yahweh greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and made vows. And then Yahweh appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the same other fish three days and three nights. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A uh, quick little note for those of you online, if the audio is bad and you can't get it, I'll just re-record the sermon and we'll put it up as a separate thing. Again, my apologies. Uh, this is just some of the stuff that we got to deal with, but we're going to move on because we must. Uh, there's times and things like that that we have to keep. Um, as we journey through the book of Jonah, we're going to dive deep into a section of Jonah that often doesn't get a whole lot of play. It doesn't get highlighted or discussed in detail, namely what happens in the boat before Jonah gets thrown overboard and then swallowed by the fish. That part is covered. We all know that part. But this part, what happens in the boat between Jonah and the sailors, just doesn't get a whole lot of attention. Now, I said last week that we're going to allow the text to kind of guide us through the book right? And stop, and we're going to stop to highlight kind of the sub-messages of the book that highlight the overall main message. Like kind of the sub-messages of the book that highlight the overall main message. If you remember, that highlight this main message. And so we're going to stop wherever we feel like there's a sub-message that's a little bit different, but that highlights the main message. And if you remember from last week, the main message is namely, this is going to work, right? Just kidding. Of course, this doesn't work. There we go. Um, and the main message, oh, we didn't, do we not do? <laughs> the main message of the book is that God is a God of mercy, whether you or I like it or not. I'm going to pause for a second, just catch my breath <laughs> hot second. Uh, I'm thankful to pastors Hugh Martin and Tim Keller who helped me see the richness of this text um, and not skip over it. Um, but we're going to spend two weeks today and next Sunday diving deep into the section. And let me just forewarn you, I think it's going to be a bit of a doozy. It's going to be one of those I think might hit really hard. Um, so fasten your seatbelts. I think it's going to be a bit of a ride as today has already um, kind of proven itself to be. Um, and so first we're going to do a review and summary, and then we're going to get to the lessons that I feel like God is trying to teach us as it kind of highlights the main message of this book. So first let's do a review and a summary. Okay. We discovered that Jonah's biggest problem is that he knows the mission that God wants to send him to, to Nineveh, isn't to judge Nineveh like he wants, but is to rather warn them so that they might repent. Don't skip my slides. Why? What are you guys doing, guys? What, what in the... Lord, we will get through this all together. <laughs> you guys okay back there? So we've discovered that Jonah's biggest issue is that he knows that his mission to Nineveh isn't 
to judge Nineveh like he wants, but it's rather to warn them so they might repent and get God's mercy. Jonah flat out disagrees with this idea and wants nothing to do with it. And so he runs as far away as possible. That's where the map is for. In the most extreme way possible, stuck on a boat headed to the end of the world for months at end. Who knows how long. But of course, God hurls a great storm at him, which leads Jonah to get thrown overboard and swallowed by the great fish. But I want to kind of suggest to you that the greatest storm that Jonah is going through, Jonah, not the sailors maybe, but Jonah, the greatest storm that he's going through that we often miss isn't the raging winds and the seas, but rather having to deal with the sailors that are on the boat with him. Notice the angry face of one of the sailors, although I don't know if that's exactly the face that we should portray, but anyways. But I hope you know and and are seeing the irony in all of this, okay? Jonah goes down to Joppa, gets on a boat to Tarshish. Why? in order to avoid having to deal with the terrible and despicable, in his eyes, pagan Ninevites, only to find himself stuck on a boat in closer quarters, mind you, headed to the end of the world for months with terrible and despicable pagan sailors. It's hilarious on some levels. But all this wouldn't be a big deal if Jonah on the boat would have been able to just kind of keep to himself, hide out, right, sleep or do whatever, and just like be left alone for months at a time. But the reason why this becomes a problem is because because of the storm that God sends, these sailors, they come looking for him because something must be done. And what happens in the story is that the narrator paints a very purposeful portrait and a purposeful comparison of the pagan sailors on one hand and then the prophet Jonah. The pagan sailors, which represent the world and maybe non-Christians, versus Jonah, who represents the church and God's people and Christians. So let's kind of go through the story line by line as we've done to kind of highlight some of these differences and and kind of see what the narrator and the author is doing. So verse 5, immediately, as soon as the thing comes, the, the, uh, the sailors are terrified and they recognize that this storm isn't your ordinary storm, that there's something supernatural going on. So they begin crying out to their own gods, throwing cargo overboard. They're doing anything and everything to help the situation. But Jonah, interestingly, is completely oblivious and or ignorant of all the danger and the significance, and therefore does absolutely nothing. He doesn't pray. He doesn't help. He does the very opposite. He goes down into the bottom of the boat, and then he falls asleep. Some theologians suggest he was snoring. That's where the soundly asleep portion comes from. So while the sailors are seeking the divine and the spiritual, Jonah is running from the divine and the spiritual. Then in verse 6, the captain, because he knows who's on his boat, right? Everyone paid their fare. He understands where everyone is. Realizes that someone is missing and not helping with the cause. So he goes down to the bottom of the boat and essentially yells at Jonah. He says, dude, get up and call on your God. We have to notice that while on one hand, the prophet's bigotry and closedness to other people leads him to this boat, the pagans on the boat are open and inclusive to anyone and everyone. And more interestingly, as Jonah is getting up from his sleep, here is a pagan sailor captain of the boat saying the exact same words in Hebrew that God had spoken to him in the beginning. Arise and call out. The pagans to whom Jonah was called by Yahweh to point back to Yahweh are now being used by Yahweh to point the prophet back to Yahweh. Then in verse 7, the sailors, they cast lots. This is a very common pagan spiritual practice, right? Where they uh, basically by doing so, they discern what the will of the gods are for them. And it's basically like an overblown game of straws, if you know what, you know what that is. Basically, back in those days, they might have done something like this. They might have taken some bunch of sticks or whatever they had on hand, and they might have carved everyone's name on it. Boom, everyone carves a name. And then they have a way of either like throwing it or picking it. And then basically, the stick with the name that got chosen is supposed to be the will of the gods. And of course, in this situation, crazy enough, Jonah's name gets picked. God uses, in some ways, maybe like a stupid game, a pagan practice to still bring the attention that this is about Jonah in some way, shape, or form. Then in verse 8, the pagans, realizing that it is all Jonah's fault, begin a rapid fire series of questions. Now, let's lay aside the specific questions and the answers. We'll get to that next week. But did you notice something interesting? Notice that the pagans do not immediately get enraged and angry and turn on Jonah. See, they could have been like, wait, 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 wait. So you trying to tell me that the reason why we're about to die in a minute is because of you? 
because you're running away from your God. You know what? Forget it. And then just, there he goes. It's actually the natural sinful human reaction, if we're just being honest. Don't be a nice person. Just be a regular person. And this is what you would do, right? If anything, to save everybody, you just throw them over. But, but it gets better even. And then rather than kill him immediately, they actually do a very interesting, they ask him, hey, what can we do to make your God less angry? It almost seems fake <laughs> that they're doing it this way, right? Talk about a bunch of respectable and caring sailors. I, when I read this story, I, I imagined like pirates, right, kind of thing. And, you know, they're never portrayed as respectable or caring, but they're so thoughtful and sensible in this place. Jonah, is there anything we can do? Anything, bro, anything that might make your God less angry? Anything. And of course, Jonah's answer to that is, throw me overboard. And the sailor's response to it is like, yeah, mm, yeah, we're not going to be able to do that. No, 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 thank you. So much so, they begin to row frantically, desperately. That word isn't there actually in the Greek, but they, they, they're rowing back to shore. Somehow, they don't think they have the right to kill Jonah, although it makes very logical sense to all of us, I think. They try to save Jonah even though this is his fault. But then, of course, when they do, God makes the storm stormier, and then they're like, oh, shoot, we're not going to be able to do what we want to do. So then what do they do? Then they call on Yahweh, something that Jonah has not yet done throughout this entire story. And they pray for mercy. Do you notice they pray that what they're about to do is only because God made it clear that there's no other way, that this is God's will. They surrender to God's will, something Jonah did not do, and they plead for mercy, something that Jonah doesn't want to do. If you're noticing in the story, at every single turn, Jonah is outshined by the sailors in every imaginable way, and it isn't even close. Now, I think if we're hearing this, maybe, hopefully this will kind of spur in us this question, like, okay, like, Peter, I get it. It's a really bad look for Jonah. Like, he looks bad. Like, I, I get that. But, I mean, what's the big deal? He had a bad day, maybe. Or another way we might ask the question is like, what difference does it make in my life today? What does the failures of a prophet long ago on a stupid boat in the middle of some stupid sea do have to do with me? And I think the answer that God is trying to teach us is that he is trying to teach Jonah something and in turn, I think, teach the church something that we all really need to hear and learn. And that's what we hope to do today. And so I have four lessons for you today, okay? We're going to go through these. I try to tag them like phrases that you would understand, so it's helpful for you to remember. One, we're all in this together. Secondly, ugh, stop embarrassing me. Three, talk is cheap. Put your money where your mouth is. And then four, God is going to be God. Okay, we're going to go through these one by one, figuring out the lessons. And I hope by the end, you'll see that they all point to the bigger lesson of Jonah, that God is a merciful God. So let's jump in and go through this together. We're all in this together. Let's go back to verse six real quick. When the captain realizes that not everyone is contributing to the, hey, let's not die today effort, a.k.a. all hands are not on deck, he finds a sleeping Jonah and wakes him up. And he says this, how is it that you are sleeping? Get up and call. Now in Hebrew, this phrase, how is it that you're sleeping, carries a specific connotation that can be translated more along the lines of, what is the matter with you? What is wrong with you? How can you possibly sleep during a time like this? Now, I hope you know, these phrases are phrases that parents should never say to their children when they make a mistake. Although I think some parents do. I know my parents did. Because to ask these types of questions, what's the matter with you? What's wrong with you? What were you thinking? So on and so forth, is to not only question their intelligence and their sanity, what it does is it questions their humanity. Like, how could you be so dull or dumb or whatever to do this? How could you not know the basics of what it means to be a human being? That's essentially what we're doing. That's why it's very bad to do this to our children. But in this scenario, it is appropriate, in my opinion, for the captain to ask it this way because what he cannot fathom is just how Jonah could care not one bit about the fact that all the people on the boat were going to die. He's basically saying, Jonah, isn't it common human courtesy that you would care about the fact that we're all dying, that you would care about humanity and cherish human life? It's a simple question. I think we can all ask it, right? Common human courtesy. What it means to be human is to care that other humans would live, you and I all together. But the fact of the matter is, the captain is saying, 
It doesn't matter who you are, pagan or not, Jew, no matter whose fault it was, the end result is that they're all either going to die together or live together. It's one or the other. Because they're all in the same boat. And they're all facing the same danger. And they should all want the same outcome. Should being the operative word, right? So the cop- captain is saying to Jonah, dude, get up. How can you be so selfish and so oblivious to the things that are going on that we're all going to die? And like I said, he uses even the same words that God used to call Jonah as if that wasn't enough. And I think this is very true and necessary for our world today. Because simple matter of fact is Christians and non-Christians, guess what? We're all in the same boat. When Hurricane Laura was storming through the Gulf, headed to our shores, Hurricane Laura does not give a you-know-what about what race you are, how old you are, how educated you are, what house you live in. It doesn't care, does it? We live in a pandemic, global pandemic, and COVID does not care what you're like, how tall you are, how old you are before it infects you. It'll just find a person that they can infect and then it'll move. We're all in the same boat. But I think worse, or maybe more, I think the captain is saying, hey, if you're a man of faith, why aren't you using your faith for the good of all? Christian or non-Christian, shouldn't we care for the common good and the sanctity of all? Jonah, if you're a man of faith, why aren't you using your faith for the good of all? Everyone else is doing it. How come you're not doing it? Why is it that Jonah doesn't do anything? And before we go and, and, and say anything about Jonah, for us, I think the same question is, we live in the same neighborhoods, go to the same schools, live in the same work, go to the same workplaces, drive the same street, eat at the same McDonald's or whatever, and yet we often don't do anything about the common issues that plague all of us. Now, if that comment angers you, confuses you, let me be a little bit more real just for one minute, real quick. This past Monday and Tuesday, all of us in our city, because we know a thing or two about hurricanes, we're all being told that there was a very, very good chance that Laura was going to be a catastrophic and historic storm, which it was, and that it was barreling straight towards Galveston and our city, Houston. So all of us, unless you live in a cave, we were checking the weather and any type of different weather to the point where I was suggesting you should check out this weather source because it's the most consistent and the most reliable. We were all worried, as we should be. Some of us were panicked. Maybe that was whatever. But no matter what, it was all in the forefront of our minds, was it not? We were all thinking about it. We were checking the news forecast quite often. And then by Wednesday morning, it was fairly clear that this storm was going to completely miss us. And completely miss us, it actually did. And the question that I want to ask, again, just to be real, is how many of us didn't breathe a huge sigh of relief and weren't tempted to forget all about it and didn't check it ever again because it wasn't going to hit Houston? Thank you, Jesus, that we're okay. And then you're whoop, done. Wednesday morning, I checked the forecast, and for a moment, I had that temptation. And in that moment, I felt God say to me, how can you relax, Pete Chung? Are not my people in imminent danger? Are not my people your people? Arise. Cry out for mercy to me for them. Every day, I checked the devastation, and I prayed. This was a top 10 storm A top 10 hurricane over the last century, apparently. Our neighbors in Louisiana, western Louisiana, are devastated. I know, we didn't get but a drop of rain. Do we see the world the way that Jonah does? Do we know the world the way that Jonah does? Where he only wants to love and serve the good of the people that are his people? even though God clearly wants to love and serve the good of all people? 
because before we were Christians, church, we we're all humans made in the image of God. We're all people Christ died to give life to, and therefore people who are all infinitely precious to God. And I think in some ways, this is a definitively prominent message that God is wanting to speak to us today in our times, especially right now with all the stuff that we're going through. That we're in the, we're in the same boat with those in western Louisiana, and we're in the same boat with Jacob Blake and his family, with all the other people who have been um, mercilessly killed in the past, and with our country, whether you like it or not, with our government, whether you like it or not, that seems to be ripping apart at the seams. We're all in the same boat. Jacob Blake's sister, Letetra Weidman, said it well or best. I apologize if you can't read it. I'll read it for you. He says, she says this, I am my brother's keeper. And when you say the name Jacob Blake, make sure you say father, cousin, uncle, son. But more importantly, make sure you say human. A human life. Where human and his life matters. This has been happening to my family for a long time. It happened to Emmett Till. Emmett Till is my family. Philando, Mike Brown, Sandra. I've shed tears for every single one of these people that this has happened to. This is nothing new. I am not sad. I am not sorry. I'm angry and I'm tired and I'm numb. I've been watching police murder people who look like me for years. I don't want your pity. I want change. Why? Because we're all family. Maybe God is asking us, if not who, if not us, people made in the image of Yahweh, but more importantly, people who belong to Yahweh, the almighty creator, because we chose to, people who belong to Jesus, the crucified and resurrected. Now, if not us, then who should use their faith for the common good of all, church? If there was ever a time such as this, then is it not now? Because we're all in this together, Right? Then lesson number two. Oh, stop embarrassing me. Now, we've all probably said this a thought, a time or two, or at least you wanted to say it. Maybe you're too Korean to not say it for those of you who are Korean or Asian in here, right? But we've probably wanted to one, two, or a thousand, or a hundred thousand times, and most likely directed at your parents, if we're just being honest. Sorry for the parents in your, but you did it to your parents, so it's okay, right? But the message of this simple phrase is easy Mom, Dad, bruh. You're embarrassing me. You're making me look bad. Just stop. Be cool for one sec. Just be cool, please. But when I see what's going on between Jonah and the sailors, I feel like this is something that maybe God is saying to Jonah and therefore to us. See, Jesus says in the Gospel of John that the way that the world will know that we're Christians is through the way that we love one another. That just like our Savior didn't come to the world to lord over his authority and then stand above and judge, but rather serve and die as a ransom for others, that we should. Why? Because that is what it means to be a follower of Christ. That in the end, Christianity, our faith, our God, is marked by a greater care for others more than a care for ourselves. And the question is, who in this situation on the boat headed to Tarshish exemplifies this the best? We all know the answer. It's the sailor. It's not even close. Now, the answer to that question, obviously, is quite frankly a bit embarrassing for the church. But on one hand, it's, it's one thing for Jonah to be a terrible prophet, embarrassing enough as it is, but it's a whole other thing for the sailors, by all intents and purposes, all the way through at every turn, to play the role that Jonah is supposed to play. And by the way, I'm not even talking about the fact that the sailors recognize that the storm is like a God thing and that they pray. No, 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 even beyond that, the fact that they don't immediately want to kill Jonah is mind-boggling to me. For some reason, they want to save Jonah. They want and desire the good of all, not just the good for me. Somehow they give Jonah the very mercy for the other that Jonah hates and is running away from. It's crazy. Jacques Lowe, a very famous theologian, he says this. In this episode, hope, justice, and integrity reside not with Jonah, but with the captain and the sailors. Though blameless victims, the sailors never cry injustice. Finding themselves in a dangerous situation, not of their making, they seek to solve it for the good of all. 
They n- never do they wallow in self-pity, berate an angry God, condemn an arbitrary world, target the cul- culprit Jonah for vengeance, nor promote violence as an answer. They represent God the way he's supposed to be represented in every single way, and of course, better than Jonah. Is this not the world looking at the church and saying, yo, that Jesus, I can get down with. He's pretty dope. But y'all Christians, mm, I'm not messing with y'all. Leaders, but especially parents, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to make you mad. But in my years of youth as a youth pastor, I've heard too many times to count, unfortunately. Many students tell me, Pastor Pete, I cannot and I will not and I therefore do not believe in God Because my parents who call themselves hardcore Christians are people I never want to become like, let alone have anything to do with. In times like this, the church is supposed to be a place where people go, how is it that in crazy times like this you'll have such hope, joy, and peace? But yet it seems like sometimes the world, they lap us around and around again. And we haven't even discussed the fact that this probably would have been like the best opportunity for Jonah to ever evangelize to these sailors. If they're in moments of terror and they're about to die. They're literally being like, Jonah, pray to your God to see if your God would do something. And he just flat out doesn't do it. Made me pray all week long. Lord, by your grace, may we, your church, ever be the salt and the light that you call us to be. The third, talk is cheap. Put your money where your mouth is. Now, knowing what we've learned so far, it makes me ask two simple questions. First, how is it that the sailors get God like the way that they do? And then second, what makes a prophet a prophet? Or what makes a Christian a Christian? Like what makes a follower of Jesus or God a follower of Jesus? Now, I think the reason why the sailors are able to act this way in a very pressure-packed situation, don't forget, they're about to die, so that's, that's about as, worse, as, as bad as it gets, is a thing that the theologians call common grace. Now, common grace is defined like this. It's a teaching that God gives, wis- gifts of wisdom, moral insight, goodness, and beauty to all humanity, regardless of race, religion, education status, etc., 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 That because we're all people made in the image of God, created in his likeness, he can and he does bestow on all of us, at times, not at all times, things that resemble him and are like him. And then Tim Keller takes it up one notch and he says this, Common grace, therefore, means that non-believers often act more righteously than believers despite their lack of faith, whereas believers remaining sin often act far worse than their right belief in God would lead us to expect. If you think this is crazy, we just spent an entire summer looking at parables. Many, if not most of them, Jesus addresses to the Pharisees who are the most holy, righteous, Jewish, and yet they do not do what we expect those folks to do. Then knowing this, I think it helps us to answer the second question, that what makes a prophet a prophet or a Christian a Christian is actually, as we've said in here before, not maybe what we think it is. For Jonah's time, I think they thought that being a Jew is pedigree, ethnicity, history, and tradition, and the like. For our time, I think our reasons are things like our parents or our family. I was born in a Christian home, or how much we serve, how much we know, or how well we can talk the Christian talk. But we all know that you can talk the biggest game you want, but if you can't back it up, it really means nothing. You know that you don't want to be this dude. The person who shows up to the court and they got the gear up to the nines, but they can't ball for one hot second. Everybody knows. Everybody has a friend. Sorry for for the male uh, sports example, but it's just, right? They 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 got the Kobe jersey. They got the matching shoes, the matching socks. They got the sleeve. They got the headband. They got the whole bit, but they can't shoot, nor dribble, nor do anything. It's kind of like an intellectual face. Sometimes we'll say it where we like, know all the right answers, but we can't live them out, especially when it counts. It's like where you can define grace and mercy, but you can't and you won't live it or give it. For some of us, it may be a private faith, where when you're on your own or when you're at church in this little place or at a prayer meeting or whatever, it looks great, 
but if we're being honest, it impacts nobody outside of your own little circle. We said this in here many times, but what makes a Christian a Christian is someone who hears what Jesus says and then does what he says the way that he says to do it. It's about as plain and simple as it gets. That's why Sinclair Ferguson puts it like this. He says, no past privilege, nor all past privileges put together, no past obedience, nor fruitfulness and service can ever substitute for present obedience to the word of God. Great blessings only bring present fruitfulness when they are met with continuing obedience. Jonah, talk is cheap, bro. Put your money where your mouth is. You notice in the, sec- in, in the scripture, he says that he fears Yahweh. One of my interns doing, an, uh, doing the outline got enraged. I was like, what do you mean you fear Yahweh, bro? Get the f- out of here. You don't mean that for a second. You don't fear God. And we all know that None of this or a lot of this or a lot of talk won't ever convince anyone to follow Christ. They need to see it, experience it, feel it. Put your money where your mouth is. And then the last lesson, God going to be God. I got to admit, this is my version of haters going to hate, which is a really bad phrase, but it's the only thing I could think of. So I just put it up there. This is where if you're feeling really down and like, oh my goodness, da, da, da. This is where grace and mercy comes, shining through like a shooting star in the night sky. So far, admittingly, Jonah and the church is looking really bad. (laughs) For many of us, we might be feeling beat up, feeling down. You might be emitting a lot of anger towards this way for telling me or for me telling you these things. And while, yes, Jonah has made a mockery of God in many ways, a mockery of his own calling in a lot of ways, while God has indeed made and had said some strong messages to Jonah and the world through the sailors, and yes, while the sailors outshine Jonah to all of it, all of it, as I've said, no matter all of that, the main message of the book in this section is still at the same time that God is a God of mercy, whether you like it or not. Now, you might not feel that way right now because of what we talked about so far. But what we're going to see is that Basically, what God is trying to say is no amount of running or mistakes will stop God from being God as he wants, to whom he wants, when he wants. That yes, consequences for sin is true. There are consequences when you sin in our lives. We learned that last week. But it will not stop God from doing ultimately what he wants to do. Now, if you remember, I said at the beginning that the whole story of Jonah is quite ironic, right? Because the pagans, right, the, the pagans, the very pagans that Jonah did not want to do anything with He gets stuck on the boat with. But more greater than that irony is a greater mastery that I think we cannot miss, that God is indeed going to be God as he wants, when he wants, to who he wants. See, Jonah is running from God because he cannot stand the thought of giving mercy to those stupid and despicable Ninevites, using his mind. But in the boat, through all of his blunders and mistakes, Jonah somehow experiences and learns a bit of mercy through the sailors. And then there's an ultimate twist and irony that I think we cannot miss. That somehow through what happens next, Jonah learns true mercy and gets mercy and gives mercy to the sailors, although he has no idea he's doing any of it. Okay? Check it out. Jonah, throughout all of this, after all this is said and done, finally says, look, just throw me in. And you have to remember that to this point, he really hasn't said a whole lot. Yeah, he said, I'm a Hebrew and so on and so forth, but he really hasn't done a whole lot. But in this moment, he says to the sailors and not to God, and that's really important to keep in mind. He says to the sailors and say, hey, throw me in and all of this will go away for you. Now, the question we have to ask is, why does Jonah say this? Like, what is it trying to, like, what what was he doing? What what, what changed, right? Now, honestly speaking, many theologians are quite torn because the text doesn't simply or explicitly tell us what it is. It's inferred. Some say that it means that Jonah could have just given up on life. Be like, whatever, I don't care. Just throw me in. Whatever, bro, I'm over it. Maybe it is that Jonah, right, is so angry and so upset that he'd rather just die than go to Nineveh and do what God tells him to. Some suggest that Jonah had a complete change of heart and he was saying, okay, God, I surrender. I'm yours. Just just go ahead. I'm good. Do with me as you wish. But as I think it through and read and, and kind of, you know, read as much as I can about the book of Jonah, I think the answer, as some have suggested, is somewhere in between. Now notice that Jonah says, throw me in because when you do, it'll become calm for you. Again, he's not talking to God, for God, or addressing God at all. 
He's addressing everything to and for the sailor. And I think this is important because this is what happens. And Jonah is recognizing what is actually going on. He sees with his eyes that these terrified men, these men he thought were despicable and worth nothing, all of a sudden he realized that these terrified men are trying anything and everything just to live. And somehow throughout the entire episode, they do nothing wrong, they do nothing hateful, they do nothing hurtful. They're respectful, caring, and thoughtful the entire time. And it's crazy. And I think as a result, Jonah's heart just, just a little bit melts for them. Don't, don't go crazy. Jonah isn't like completely changed. He hasn't like, you know, turned 180 degrees. I'm not what He feels a little bit of pity, I think, for these people. Just a little bit. So then he decides then that it's not really fair to punish all these people, all these sailors. I mean, like, look at how hard they're trying, I think he's thinking. Like, it sucks, yeah, that I might have to die. But you know what? They don't deserve to die. At least not for me anyway. I should die because God's angry at me. It's the least I can do. So he's like, hey, you know what, y'all? Just go ahead and throw me in. Now, and then when they throw Jonah in, everything calms down. And then something crazy happens. It says that they immediately feared Yahweh more greatly than they did before. If you know the story of Mark 4 or the, in the Gospels, that's the same thing that happens to disciples of Jesus. This fear, I think very closely, is the fear of Yahweh that is the beginning of wisdom, as it says in Psalms. And then as soon as they fear, get this fear, which is what happens to all of us when we have this fear of Yahweh, they offer sacrifices, make vows, and they worship. It's what happens to all of us. And as crazy as it sounds, after all this is said and done, the sailors are saved. They come to salvation. And this is a genuine salvation, in my opinion, for two reasons. One, they give offering and make vows after the storm has gone away. And then they use God's divine personal name, Yahweh, like they've known it their entire life. Yahweh this, Yahweh that, Yahweh this. Only what Israelites do. So here they are making vows, right? Not to get rid of the storms, but after the storm has all gone away and they do it using Yahweh's name. Do you see what's going on here? Somehow, though Jonah did not want to and was not trying to, God uses Jonah ultimately to show the sailors of mercy the likes which they have never, ever seen. And through it, they're brought to genuine faith and salvation. That somehow through the end of it all, everything ends with the praise of Yahweh. Notice the sailors' reaction. They're not like, oh my gosh, that God, dude, dude, he is crazy. Like, He's going to chase after one of his prophets and then when the prophet don't listen, he's going to send a storm and all this crazy. That dude is crazy. you got to stay away from him. Again, parents, not to be mean, but it's oftentimes when our, how our students react or how our, teach, our kids react when we discipline them. They hate us for it. But they praise Yahweh. I mean, talk about God being God. Like, you know? And then something even a bit crazier happens that maybe we missed. And this is the reason why, in my opinion, that God is going to be God and the thing that we need to learn. And also this is the reason why Jonah is referenced by Jesus as a mini Jesus. He's one that foreshadows. Like the worst prophet maybe known to man becomes a person that is a mini Jesus that Jesus even references him to that he somehow foreshadows. Here's why. Did you notice? And we'll finish here. Did you find it interesting that the moment Jonah is thrown overboard, he becomes a complete afterthought. He just disappears from the story for the sailors. Just done. Did you notice? Did you notice that Jonah gets no praise, no mention, none of it? All the glory and honor and everything goes to Yahweh? Like you would think that the sailors would be like, dude, that Jonah, that's a good dude, man. Like he sacrificed himself for us. Like, dude, he's, he's good. I know, we, we, got, we, we got him wrong. We thought he was like a jerk, but you know what? He's actually a pretty good dude, Right? In the Asian circles, it'd be like, you know, like parents would be like, oh, you know what? He's Akko. He's like wasteful. Like he should have married somebody. Like he's a good dude. But they don't do that. They actually don't do that at all. And the reason is because this isn't a story about a heroic figure who sacrifices himself for others. History is littered with those. Christian and non-Christian. But what I think the sailors see is this. They see a God 
who takes one of his chosen ones and sacrifices one of his chosen ones for the sake of their enemies. God takes and substitutes one of his own, his chosen prophet, his precious chosen prophet and trans and substitutes it, sacrifices them for the sake of enemies, making his own die so that the others, his enemies, do not have to die. It's what we call substitutionary sacrifice, a, coin, a term coined by, I think, Tim Keller mostly. And this utterly changes them. It transforms them because simply put, I think they're going like, who does that? No one. It'd be like a king or an emperor voluntarily sacrificing his own son or someone that's very important to him in order to save the foreigners they're trying to conquer. It just doesn't happen. Even in the church, the number of times I've heard, Pete, don't matter what you say, that husband is going to protect his wife. Like they're going to get, it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, it doesn't matter. He's always going to back his wife. But is that the way it's supposed to be? We take care of our own. As long as we're safe, y'all are good. So I think the sailors are like, who does that? And of course, we all know the answer. It's Yahweh and Yahweh only. He who takes his son, sacrifices his own son, and not even just the son, one of his Trinitarian self, so that he can make his enemies, worthless enemies in so many ways, if we're just being honest, his adopted children. The king and the God who pours justice on his undeserving son, the Savior, and then pours mercy on the undeserved, wretched sinners that we all are so that we can all be in the same boat together. The craziest part is he does all of it and Jonah has no idea. We learned a lot of tough things today and John and Eunice and the praise team can get ready in. Some of it's tough. Some of it hits pretty tough, I hope, in some ways. But I hope that the thing that you walk away from as you are reading through Jonah and you see is that the overwhelming message is that no matter what, God is God. He is going to be God. He is unchanging. He is always faithful. He is always good. Through all of our failures, through all of our storms, through all the things that we do, he will never give up nor forsake us. He will always have our back and he will always stand with the cross, a.k.a. he will always die so that you and I don't have to and the world the same, that he never gives up. And when you understand that we sinners are the enemy that he sacrifices himself for, then our lives change. That's why we should be in the same boat. Not because it's a duty, not because it makes us look bad, because he did it for us. The one person, the one God in all of the universe. Let me put it like this. Sin is the trump card. I hate that term, but it's so true. It is the trump card that says you are you and I am me and y'all are on your own. Sin is the thing that God says, you know what? I can stay right here in my perfection, in my holiness, and I'm going to leave y'all wretched sinners all by yourself. I don't got to do nothing. Why? Because the payment of sin is what? The wages of sin is death. It's the thing. It's justice. But he says, no. Because we're in the same boat. Because we're all in this together, right? And if it takes me having to die so that you don't have to, if it takes me pouring my wrath and my judgment and my anger upon sin, upon my sinless and innocent and undeserving son so that you and I can live and then help other people to know this grace, then you'll say, I'm all in because we're all in this together. I 
because he dreams of a world and a place where those who are impacted by his grace would live this way. And if there's ever a time in this world where we need as a church to stand and say, we're all in this together, that God is for all of us, that yeah, it means surrender. Don't, don't get it twisted. I'm not saying we can do whatever we want. We need to follow and submit to his ways, but we're all in this together. And if we are, then the church will rise up and guess what will happen? The whole world will rise with it. So church, are you in? Are we in it together? Well, when this pandemic is over, will we all point our finger and say, yeah, you were on that side of the fence, you were on that side, just forget you, I'm on my own. And for those of you who feel maybe terrible at this moment because maybe you haven't lived well, maybe you haven't done your thing, maybe you haven't been the way that you ought or you should or you know to be, will you then trust and know that it's not about you, that God is going to be God because he's God and you can't stop him, but he'd rather use you. So why don't you surrender? And then he'll do his thing. And then all of us will say, glory, hallelujah, there's no one like you, God. That everywhere you go, the people you see in this room and online and the people on the streets, that we'll say, we're all in this together. You're my brother. You're my family. We're all family in this together. And my God died for you. He died for me. And he gives life to all. Will you join? So church, will you take some time? Pray for those who don't have homes in Louisiana. Pray for those thousands of people who don't have family because of this pandemic. Pray for the many people, regardless of skin color, who cannot go out on the streets and not think about being shot down because of their color. Pray. You don't have to give them money. You don't have to do all these things. Pray and say, God, would you please do something for your world that you love so much? And help me to dream that this is the God that we serve and this is the God that we love and that you would do this. Because if God can use Jonah, why can't he use you? So will you pray? Just pray. Call on your God. Because not maybe, for he will indeed do something about the plight of the world. For he hears and he knows and he sees and indeed he will move. Let mercy abound because God is a God of mercy. Receive it for yourself, surrender to it, and then give it to the world to know and the world will change. So will you pray? Will you join me? All those out on the internet, if you heard it, will you join me and pray? God, be merciful to us. Hear our prayers. We surrender to you. Let us pray together.